Hello, thank you so much for joining the webinar hosted by the Caltech Alumni Book Club. Octavia E. Butler's archive bequeathed to the Huntington Library offers unique insights into this fascinating author. To tell us more, we invited Natalie Russell, Assistant Curator of Literary Collections at the Huntington uh, from the Huntington Library. Her talk is entitled Opening Pandora's Box, the Octavia E. Butler Papers at the Huntington Library. After Natalie's presentation, if we have time, we will take a few questions from the online participants. Natalie has been at the Huntington for 12 years. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Cinema Television Production from the University of Southern California and a Master's of Library and Information Science from San Jose State University. She is a native Californian and a member of the Pasadena Tournament of Roses. Now, please welcome Natalie Russell. Good afternoon. I'm happy to be here today um, and to tell you a little bit about Octavia E. Butler. So the first question that many people ask, of course, who is Octavia E. Butler? She was the first female African-American science fiction writer, really as an author, at least as we understand it. She was a pioneer. She has been called the grand dame of science fiction. She's a powerful contributor to contemporary literature. Washington Post Book World wrote this about her. Octavia E. Butler is one of the finest voices in fiction, period. A master storyteller, Butler casts an unflinching eye on racism, sexism, poverty, and ignorance, and lets the readers see the terror and beauty of human nature. She was a master of character creation. Locus wrote, she is one of those rare authors who pays serious attention to the way human beings actually work together and against each other and she does so with extraordinary plausibility. Butler used science fiction to open doors and worlds to herself and to others. She put people of color in her stories, but more importantly, the voice of a person of color in her stories, her perspective. Butler once said, there was an automatic assumption that in stories about black people, racism would be the most important issue, often the only issue. But Butler's stories are so much more than just race stories. To me, the attraction of science fiction, Butler said, is just the freedom, that there isn't anything I can't do in it. There isn't any issue I can't address. Butler's frequent themes include power, identity, race, of course, but also gender, sexuality, economic and social class, religion, the environment, and humanity. Octavia E. Butler was born June 22, 1947, in Pasadena. Her mother was a maid, and her father was a shoe shiner who died when Butler was very young. She was an only child. She was awkward, shy. She was very tall. She grew to be six feet tall, and she was a bit of a daydreamer. For her, writing became an outlet. She had a strict Baptist upbringing, and many fun things weren't allowed in her household. But writing was allowed. Um, in fact, it was encouraged. It was a solitary thing that she could do, which Butler enjoyed. It was safe, and she was left alone to write in her own world. She started out writing horse stories, and then she wrote romances. She was an avid reader. She fell in love with the library from a very early age and eventually started taking that love to write her own stories, really as soon as she understood that writing was a thing that you could do, that someone had to write the stories she enjoyed reading. She had this idea that I could be a writer. She credits the B science fiction film Devil Girl from Mars with her shift to science fiction. She said she was watching this film on television and realized as a young girl that I could write a better story. This movie is really quite terrible. So she sat down to try. Reflecting back on this incident, she said her first attempts were probably no better than the film she was watching but she started writing science fiction. She really loved these science fiction stories. She was reading Asimov and, and different serials. And she felt that all the characters were drinking, smoking 30-year-old white men, which didn't describe her at all. They were hard to relate to on that level. So she said she wrote herself in so that she could be in the stories that she enjoyed reading. Now, there are many challenges for her enduring this idea of being a writer and especially being a science fiction writer, it wasn't considered a career. It was, certainly wasn't considered a career for a young black woman. 
Butler's mother's great dream for her daughter was that she would have a job where she would be able to sit down. But Butler had different dreams. She attended Pasadena City College and took every creative writing class that she could, which unfortunately wasn't very many, but she also took journalism and anything that interested her from anthropology to history to science. She did graduate with an associate's degree there, but she also faced professors like the one who told her, can't you write anything normal? She wrote her first, the, the story that earned her her first money when she was at PCC, winning first place in a literary contest. The prize winning story was to the victor, and it's about a boxing match between two people to the death. But it's not any ordinary boxing match, it's a mental boxing match by people with psionic, telepathic abilities. The reigning champion realizes that he is going to have to cheat to win this boxing match and understands the hollowness of what that kind of victory entails. Butler began this world of psionic and telepathic and telekinetic people very early on and continued to write in this world that she began creating as a young woman. She attended California State University at Los Angeles, although she never graduated there, trying to find more creative writing classes, and eventually found something called the Open Door Program, which was organized essentially by the Screenwriters Guild in Los Angeles, who looked around and realized there weren't a lot of writers of color in their profession. So they founded a, a workshop specifically for writers of color. Butler got into the workshop not, and attended, not particularly interested in screenwriting, but at least it was creative writing, something more than the journalism that she had largely been able to study. And while she was at the Open Door program, she met Harlan Ellison, who was one of the science fiction greats, both for television and also on the page. And Harlan Ellison recognized something special in Butler. And he said, you need to go to the Clarion Science Fiction and Fantasy Workshop in Clarion, Pennsylvania. The application deadline has already passed, but I will call the director, personal friend, and I'm gonna get you into this program. So Butler put up a little bit of money, her mother put up a little bit of money, even though it was a, a bit of a stretch for a career, her mother was actually quite supportive of Butler as much as she could be. And then Harlan Ellison put in a little money and Butler got on a Greyhound bus and drove straight through from Pasadena to Clarion, Pennsylvania. When she got there, she found something she wasn't expecting. Well, first, what she may have been expecting, there just weren't a whole lot of black people around. There was one other person who was one of the professors. Each week of the workshop was taught by a different active science fiction writer. And Samuel Delaney was one of those professors. Harlan Ellison, seen here, seated in front of his students, was also one of the professors. Butler didn't find a community that looked like her, but she found a community that understood her because she found a community that understood science fiction. It's the first place where she really begins to understand writing criticism and people who asked about her stories, not asking, can't you write anything normal, but asking, is this the story you were trying to tell? Is this what you meant? People who wanted to read her stories, who wanted to be entertained, who wanted to be sucked into the world that she was creating, and wanted to be sure that the words on the page reflected Butler's intention. She goes to her first science fiction convention while she's there, and she sells her first two stories. You'll notice in this photograph of Butler's class, she's standing in the back row, again quite tall, and literally almost fading into the background. There were times at which she was, felt that she was in the wrong place, but she would always come back to this experience afterwards as foundational, and in fact would go on to teach at the Clarion Workshop as it traveled to different places in the country a number of times in years later. She often talked about workshops as renting an audience to get that perspective of the story on the page matching the story in your head, and really credited this experience with much of what launches her writing career and her reflectiveness in her writing. She sells those two first stories and then doesn't sell anything else for five more years. She worked what she called scut work, menial jobs to make a living. 
She actually preferred factory work to clerical work so that she could allow her mind to wander to the worlds that she was creating. She would write motivational notes like these. I am a best-selling writer. I write best-selling books and excellent short stories. Every one of my books reaches and remains for two and more months at the top of the bestseller list. She writes these kind of motivational notes that are about her goals and about her personal um, ideas of what she's trying to get out of life. And she also writes them specific to the works that she's, she's writing. Use detail. Strive always for intensity. Tell stories filled with facts. Ultimately, she sells her first novel to Doubleday in 1975, and Pattern Master appears in 1976, a novel that utilizes those psionic telepathic characters. She quickly turns out two more novels related to this patternist world, and then she has an idea that takes her in a new direction. She actually sells that third novel before she's quite happy with it and is never happy with that publication for the rest of her life. But she wanted the advance because she knew she needed to do a different kind of research for the new novel that she wanted to write. And that new novel is Kindred. Butler had been doing a different kind of research for her earlier novels. This not so great photograph is a map drawn on a paper bag. And it's a map of the city of Forsyth, which features in the novel Mind of My Mind, her second novel. And it's actually a map of Pasadena. All of the uh, streets in pencil, uh, some of what are slightly familiar, there is a street named Lago, and De Oro might be something similar to Colorado Boulevard. But you'll notice that two of them are circled and they're just barely readable, but one is Fair Oaks and the other is in Lake, and those are written in pen. So using those real streets, one can begin to piece this map of Pasadena um, out into the story. And she has specific locations marked, including the house of the character Mary, which was where a best friend had lived, and the house of the character Carl, which was a mansion. And it's located right about where her actual model for that mansion was, the Wrigley Mansion, currently the Tournament of Roses, home on Orange Grove Boulevard. She loved the library and she wrote a lot of what she knew. But when it came to preparing Kindred, she knew she needed to examine a different geographical space and also new kinds of history. Kindred is probably Butler's best known novel. It's the story of a contemporary African-American woman who is sucked back in time to confront and ultimately to save the life of her own white ancestor, who's the son of a plantation owner. And she bounces back and forth in time multiple times because she needs to ensure the survival of this ancestor so that she herself will be born. But of course, this also makes her complicit in the slave owning era and the world of which this young white man lives. Butler always said it wasn't science fiction at all. There's, there's no science in it, which she contended was an important element of science fiction. She called it a grim fantasy. There's time travel, but there's no time machine. So there's no science or technology. She originally titled the novel To Keep Thee in All Thy Ways, hearkening back to that uh, religious upbringing. And she looked at a number of other titles. The publisher actually originally wanted to call it Dana after the main character but Butler hated that title. In a letter to the publisher, she wrote, I'm sorry you apparently disliked all four of my alternatives, but my feelings about the title Dana have not changed. I hate it. I feel it to be inappropriate to the novel. This, I do not feel that we should bow, as you said, but that we should find a title that is neither Dana nor to keep thee in all thy ways, a title we can both live with. Whatever the title, after all, I will be living with it for quite a while. She then goes on to suggest several other titles, Birthright, Time Lapse, Near of Kin, and Kindred, the first time we see the actual title that is selected for the novel in writing. She reflected in one of her speeches on the reason she wrote this novel. She really came of age at the end of the Civil Rights Movement, beginnings of the Black Power Movement, and she recognized a generation gap. 
she said there was a young man probably in one of either a black student union or a group that she had come in contact with um, and he said something that really struck her he said something along the lines of I wish I could kill off all those old people who are holding us back but I can't because I'd have to start with my own parents she recognized the anger and frustration of this young man recognized that he understood so much more about contemporary politics than she did but he didn't understand she felt his own history the heroes he had in his own family that he didn't recognize she understood where he was coming from. She had had some of those same feelings initially herself until she began to recognize the sacrifices her mother had made and understand the strides and progress that had been made in her favor over the years. And she wanted her generation to understand that. So she wrote Kindred to try and help people understand just how difficult this world was, just how challenging the life of a slave might have been, or the life of a free person surrounded by slavery might have been. She originally wanted to put a young man like the one she had heard speak into the story, but quickly realized that a young, angry man like that would have been killed before, and the story over before it had begun, if she were to try and tell that story. So she changed the main character to a woman, someone who might perhaps fly under the radar and who might have a chance of survival in that world. Many of Butler's stories feature a strong black female protagonist, sometimes as the main character, sometimes just as the most interesting character. She wanted the history of Kindred, therefore, to be right. She read everything she could. She was reading 12 Years a Slave long before it was a film that we've all seen. She was reading stories by Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman and memoirs and real stories of slaves. She traveled to Maryland and to the Maryland Historical Society to do research in the archives and try and understand everything from the geography, much as she had in that map of Pasadena, to plantation life and the setup, where people lived, how did they live, what did that scenery look like, and how might that influence the story? What were the different jobs that slaves did and where did they do them? How would they have the opportunities to interact or not interact with each other and with the world around them? While she was in Maryland, she did a little sightseeing and went to Mount Vernon just across the way. And while she was there, she found the setup of a plantation, something that she had been looking for in archives, and she found it a little bit in real life. And she brought back this map of the grounds where she begins to make annotations related to her own story, changing various buildings that would be important or not important to scale down the plantation, to note where particular characters might live. Also, she could incorporate this authentic world into that history book to make it as real as possible. Butler really includes authenticity in all of her work. She was not only an avid reader, but really an avid researcher. She kept her own clipping files on subjects as diverse as biology and botany, anthropology, history, politics, medicine, technology, cults, twins. She was spent a lot of time at the public library, particularly the central branch in downtown Los Angeles, and she was devastated by the 1986 fire. She described the library shortly after that fire as friend, teacher, lover, home. By the 1980s, she's writing full time. She has an agent, and really one might consider her a moderate success. Success meaning she's making her living as a writer. As she starts Kindred, she knows she has to devote her full time to writing, and she quits all of her menial jobs. And from the publication of Kindred onward, she makes her living writing stories. She tries writing some short stories, hoping that the turnover will be faster to keep her income stream going. And she writes some of her most amazing work, including the first story to win her a Hugo Award, Speech Jones, in 1984, followed by Blood Child, which won both a Hugo and a Nebula Award, the highest awards in science fiction. Her short story, The Evening and the Morning and the Night, utilizes a fictional disease 
But to create a fictional disease, Butler just doesn't go to fiction. She goes to nonfiction. She researches Leshnyan syndrome and Huntington's disease and phenylketonuria. And she wraps the symptoms and effects of these different real diseases to create Duria Go disease. And you'll notice some of these notes, an autosomal dominant genetic disorder, a disorder caused by the presence of a single defective dominant gene located on a chromosome other than sex chromosomes. The detail in her novels is incredible, but it doesn't always show up on the page. She always is dedicated to story, to keeping the story moving, to keeping the entertainment happening, to drawing the reader in. For her, it has to be about the story, but she grounds that fantastic in the reality. So it's never quite so unbelievable that the reader can escape the possibility that this might happen. She receives an advance to write three novels, which becomes the Xenogenesis Trilogy, and she uses that money to travel to the Amazon, both for a setting of the post-apocalyptic return to Earth from these first contact with aliens novels, but also to know about the extreme biology, things like slime molds and colonies, how different symbiotic and epiphytic and parasitic species function, different ways of creating community that she sees in the plant life as well as the animal life. She uses little notebooks to take notes like the ones on the left, some that she tucks in a pocket both for travel or walking around her own neighborhood, making drawings, making notes, and, and larger notebooks where she does everything from write out passages of the stories to write down how she's going to take the bus to go to a new book signing because she never drove a car. While she's traveling to the Amazon, she researches, of course, where she's going to go. She takes a UCLA extension trip so that she'll have access to an ornithologist, an entomologist, and a botanist and really get the science behind this early ecotourism trip. But there's also the practicalities, and she learns about the bot fly. And that, as a, a traveler from the United States, bot flies can infect an open wound and lay its eggs in a person. And that human being should then leave, it, leave this infection alone until they come back to the United States. Because if you were to scratch it or worry it or do anything, you, should, you could cause the mere insect infection to become a more serious problem. So Butler does what she does whenever she is afraid or feels powerless. She transforms those fears into strengths. She gives them to her strengths to her characters. Or she finds a different way to evaluate that fear and turn it into something positive. With the bot fly, she takes the concept of hosting the eggs of an alien creature to extremes and places human beings on an alien world where they have to, quote unquote, pay the rent, neither conquering that new world nor being conquered, but find a new relationship with these aliens, which includes young male human beings hosting the alien young inside their bodies until they're old enough to live outside the human host. And rather than making this a story of disgust and horror, as the title of the story Bloodworm might indicate, this is a story that becomes Blood Child. And it is really a story about making a choice out of love. She turns this horror into a love story. The page on the screen also shows uh, variations where the pronouns have been changed. And it's the moment when the story goes from a third person story to a first person story. Because a third person story about someone else hosting an alien being doesn't have the same impact as a first person story about me hosting an alien being. And you can see the evolution of Butler's understanding and comfort with transforming this into a love story. This is the cover of the first of the Xenogenesis novels, Dawn, a story about alien gene traders who have three genders, male, female, and uloi, and who want to breed with humans to bring out our best qualities and take out our worst qualities, hierarchy, the necessary uh, element of hierarchy in our culture being one of the elements that they wish to breed out of us. And they want to convince the last few post-World War III humans 
to be a part of this great new gene blending program, which will of course require a male human, a female human, and a male, female, and Uloi alien. The main character, Lilith, is an African-American woman who is brought into the confidence and comfort of these alien beings and who will hopefully be their liaison to convince the remaining humans this is a good idea. The cover, of course, doesn't show any black people on it at all. And to be fair to the artists, they probably didn't read the whole story, just a very brief precy about what it might be about. But this was one of the challenges that Butler's faced as she was being published. Without black people on the cover, it might sell more, but then people who were black or who were interested in seeing people of color in science fiction, like she herself had as a young woman, wouldn't pick up this novel and know that the main character was a black woman. Neither is there a photograph of Butler as the author anywhere on this novel. At one point, Butler was on an editorial panel with a number of science fiction people, and one magazine editor said, you know, you really don't need to put black people into stories, because if you want to talk about race, you can do all of that with aliens. Butler was horrified, and, and her response was that she didn't put black people into her stories because she simply wanted to talk about race. She put black people in her stories, she said, because I'm me, and I'm black, and I'm writing. The Xenogenesis stories do touch a little bit on race, but they also talk about gender and sexuality, identity, and one of Butler's most frequent themes, power. Who has it? Who doesn't? What do you do with it when you get it? Probably her second best known novel is Parable of the Sower, and then its sequel, Parable of the Talents. This was Butler's what if novel, her what if this goes on, and it really tapped into some of her greatest fears in the early 90s about where our world and where our country might be headed. She uses another young African-American woman to tell this story. And in the world that breaks down around her, this young woman creates a new religion and around it a new community for survival and to try and create a new way to move forward. There are many people who will say, if you want to read the dystopian novel of today, you shouldn't read Brave New World or 1984, but you should read Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale or Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower. After the publication of Parable of the Sower, she won a MacArthur Fellowship, commonly known as a Genius Grant, in 1995. The Genius Grant afforded her stability and validation. It allowed her to fill, fulfill some of those dreams, such as owning her own home, and also to be able to provide for her mother. Butler's mother passed away in 1999, and it's interesting to see the shift between Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents, because Parable of the Talents very much becomes a mother-daughter story after Butler's mother's death. Remember, she was an only child, and she really felt tied to her mother and wanting to care for her and to respond to everything that her mother had given to her. But Butler herself had always dreamed of moving to the Northwest. When she was young, she traveled, again on a Greyhound bus, through a large portion of the country visiting several national parks. And she fell in love with the area in Seattle. But she never felt that she could leave the Los Angeles area and her mother until after her passing. And so indeed, after her mother passes away, Butler moves to Seattle. California and Los Angeles and Pasadena in particular feature very strongly in many of her books. Parable of the Sower is just one example. It essentially starts out in a version of Altadena, Pasadena, and then the characters slowly move northward through California, heading towards a place cooler, filled with trees, and a bit more like the Northwest in Northern California. Later in her career, her final book, Fledgling, takes place in the Pacific Northwest, and you can see her new home come through in her work. By the 90s, Butler had become a popular speaker. She was teaching at the Clarion workshops. She also attended book clubs. She spoke at colleges, conventions, and conferences of all kinds. She was, felt it was very important to give back and to support students. She once said, why aren't there more science fiction black writers? There aren't because there aren't. 
What we don't see, we assume we can't be. What a destructive assumption. She hoped at one point in time to have her own foundation, to take that million, in the do million dollars in the bank kind of success and create a foundation that would support young students, boys and girls, especially African Americans, to pursue their education and also to pursue writing or science fiction writing, if that was something that appealed to them. Butler never had that kind of million dollar in the bank success, and she never had a book on the bestseller list that she so dreamed of. But she did find a comfortable life for herself, and her books have continued to grow as well as her reputation. At one point during her life, all of the black science fiction writers could be gathered on a single stage for a single panel for a conference. And that is no longer the case. Butler's legacy has inspired a generation of writers. And that generation has inspired another generation of writers who are all continuing to add to the worlds and to the thought and perspective that she first showed us. Butler died February 24th, 2006. She was only 58 years old. She died suddenly, probably of a stroke, although she did have some health problems later in her life, and we don't know exactly the cause of her death. She left 12 novels and one volume of short stories. Her legacy, as I mentioned, is quite a bit larger. She is inspiring writers today in horror, fantasy, science fiction, speculative fiction, and any number of other kinds of genre fiction that take this idea of using the parameters of a particular style and talking about whatever it is those authors wish to discuss. The other legacy that she's left is her archive, which is housed here at the Huntington Library. Butler left her archive to the Huntington in her will. And indeed, a few years after her passing, once the execution of that will was complete, two four-drawer file cabinets and 35 cartons of materials were delivered to the Huntington, ready to be processed and added to the collections. It contained a wealth of material. Butler kept nearly everything. There were drafts of manuscripts from her childhood throughout her entire life, her early horse stories, all of her published works, unpublished and unfinished works, correspondence with friends, family members, editors, agents. There are photographs, ephemera from her travels and her speaking engagements, her research notes and clippings, journal entries, and extensive notes on her writing. The archive required extensive processing over three years and opened to scholars on November 1st of 2013. During the time of its processing, we had more than 40 scholars inquire about the collection, interested in utilizing it as soon as it was open. We kept a list of all of those scholars, and as soon as the collection was open, notified them and included a link to the finding aid so that they could get a preview of coming attractions and what they would see when they arrived. The cataloging process was very intense. There was almost no original order to the materials when they came in. You can see a lovely uh, example of a number of post-it notes stuck on top of one another in the center of your screen. It was my good luck to be in the right place at the right time to be the person to actually process this material. I started with a very broad initial sort, separating materials that were manuscripts from correspondence, ephemera, and another section of materials where I simply couldn't quite identify or felt that there were materials that were kept together that it might be important to keep together trying to understand Butler's process. And slowly I went became more and more granular which eat with each sort. So you'd take the manuscripts and begin to separate them out by title as much as possible. And then from that title, you try and understand the chronology of what's the earliest draft to the latest draft. And then again, you start in on the correspondence. And the more I became familiar with the materials and the more I could see what was extant or not of any kind of organizational system Butler might have had, I could begin to tackle some of the more challenging materials. But there were definitely other challenges, post-its, not exactly archival, static page photo albums with captions written on those plastic pages, 
definitely not safe for long-term storage. Note cards and manuscripts that were labeled in Ziploc bags and plastic bags. Eventually, I was able to transfer all of those materials into archival folders, pH neutral, safe materials, uh, stored in upright and flat boxes according to the material, and provide some kind of organization as to what was there. In the end, there are 8,000 individual items and an additional 80 boxes of materials. There's an electronic finding aid available online to scholars. And since that 2013 opening date, it has become the most used collection at the institution of all materials at the Huntington. It's hovering in the, been hovering in the top five for the past couple years, but recently it's become the most used collection we have here. The other two large collections that it's usually competing with are massive collections of British materials that often span multiple centuries. So she's in very good company with many, many scholars. As I mentioned, Butler's legacy continues. As more scholars use the archive, more is being published about her, and more and more people are discovering her. She's been called the godmother of Afrofuturism. And different people describe Afrofuturism in different ways. I often like to describe it like this. It's an idea that a particular community, especially the African-American community, needs to envision its own future if it wants to get to that future. That artists and writers and creative people from that community need to imagine what that future could be like or should be like or might be like or even perhaps what you don't want that future to be like in order to inform the goals of how you would achieve that future. If you don't have any vis visible goals or goals that you can communicate and understand, then how can you have a group of people attempt to achieve that particular goal? And Afrofuturism is a way of imagining the future of the African American people. How do they fit in to the world at large? And what do they want their future to look like? Butler addresses these kinds of ideas in her work, where she presents futures, alternate histories, potential near futures like Parable of the Sower, potential very distant futures like Pattern Master, and simply tries to imagine various questions about how we as human beings relate to one another and how we should relate to one, one another when it comes to class, when it comes to identity, when it comes to gender, sexuality, race, race, ethnicity, geography, when it simply comes down to our goals as humans and compassionate beings having relationship with people around us since we cannot live alone. Butler wrote in an essay that was published in her anthology of short stories, Positive Obsession, she wrote this, but still I'm asked, what good is science fiction to black people? What good is any form of literature to black people? What good is science fiction thinking about the present, the future, and the past? What good is its tendency to warn or to consider alternative ways of thinking and doing? What good is its examination of the possible effects of science and technology or social organization and political direction? At its best, science fiction stimulates imagination and creativity. It gets reader and writer off the beaten track, off the narrow, narrow footpath of what everyone is saying, doing, thinking, whoever everyone happens to be this year. And what good is all this to black people? And I might add, and what good is all of this to people? Butler told stories. For her, it was always about the story. And she manages to weave in very serious concepts and ideas, her concerns, her fears. At one point, she comments that as a writer, you don't really need to go see a psychiatrist because you can throw all of your garbage into your writing and cope with it that way. She puts her fears, she puts her hopes. When she feels powerless, she writes as it might feel to be a person with power. 
I often think of the Spider-Man analogy. Other people draw it from different places. But with great power comes great responsibility. If you had power, what would you do with it? She imagines a world that she belongs to. She writes herself in. She can see herself or versions of herself, who she is, who she wishes she could be, who she might want to be, and wraps them up in stories. She always wanted to say that you would have a reader pick up one of her novels and she wouldn't let them go until she was ready to let them move on with the story. That was her job as a writer. That's what she wanted her bestsellers to do, to be gripping, to have people want to read those stories. She wanted those words to be read by millions of people. She's continuing to touch us today. Her themes are more resonant. If you read Parable of the Sower, it might feel like she was it was written last year instead of 20 plus years ago. She is being researched. She is being written about in the scholarly community. And she is touching people in the public as well. Her works are frequently used in high school and college curricula. And more and more works, not just Kindred and Parable of the Sower, but her entire oeuvre. It's exciting to see how she is moving forward. The archive is certainly an important part of that. But I think it is a testament to her own self-reflective, self-persistent, intelligent genius, although she would never use that word for herself, well-researched, hard work that is coming to fruition that continues to delight, to entertain, and hopefully also to make us think just a little bit more. Thank you so much for listening, and um, we'll try and answer some questions if anyone has them. Um, I had a few come in, and thank you, Natalie, for um, showing us how Butler was able to blend history and science and personal experiences into her into her writing. That was, I thought was really interesting, especially um, being at a place that science is such a big um, part of our world on how dedicated she was to doing the research and finding out um, about those diseases so she can weave them into her stories. I thought that Absolutely. was really great. It's definitely something she does on many levels and many topics. She wants the science to be right. Um, and it personally fascinated her. It's one of the things that I think makes her, her work so dynamic. Right. Um, so I had a couple of questions come in. Um, one was, how did she become so fond of the Huntington to will her documents there? And also, while you were going through her documents, um, did you yourself have to um, research more about uh, Black history, culture, and society to correctly organize the material? Okay, so the first question about how the papers came here um, is a really interesting story. Our previous curator of literary manuscripts heard Butler speak. Butler came to speak on a, a, a panel, I believe, of women writers that was hosted here at the Huntington in the late 80s. And the curator heard Butler speak that day and was able to talk with her af afterwards and say, do you have plans for your papers? Um, the Huntington would be interested and invited Ms. Butler back to the Huntington to kind of get a tour of what does that mean? What would it mean if your papers were to come here? What would we be asking for? How would they be used? How would we care for them here at the Huntington? Um, what does it mean to have your archive in a special collections library? And Ms. Butler did that and then went about her work in her life. And over a decade later, she came back to the Huntington, um, flew in from Seattle to, for a lecture, for a speaking engagement. And again, she never drove, so our same curator was still here and was tasked with picking up Ms. Butler from her hotel and driving her back to the Huntington and back um, for the lecture. And while they were riding in the car, she had the opportunity to tell her, you know, Ms. Butler, I don't want to nag, but I just want to let you know that our interest is not going away. I'm not going to bug you about it, but I want, you to, I, I want to be clear that this is an enduring interest of ours. And Ms. Butler turned to her and said, Sue, the Huntington is in my will. 
and and that was that. The curator didn't hear anything more. She, you know, kind of had this moment of thank you, that's wonderful. I'm so excited to hear that, um, but didn't press for any details, and really thought that you know someday her successor and somewhere down the line that people would be thrilled and excited when the archive finally came to the Huntington. And of course, from that point, Butler passed away maybe six years later. Um, and Sue Hodson, the curator, was still here at the Huntington when the archive arrived. And she had never expected to see it in person. Um, but in part, the reason that it came here is because we asked. Um, and hopefully, she was impressed by what she saw when she came to tour the Huntington behind the scenes and understand um, what kind of impact she could make with that archive. As far as the research that I did while I was working on the archive, so I did not know anything about Butler before I started processing, and I had not read any of her works. Before I finished her works, uh, finished processing the archive, I did read all of her published works. Um, in part simply for identification. Sometimes you'd have a, a single loose piece of paper and if you saw a character's name on it, you might be able to identify which novel it's from or which of a trilogy of novels that particular page is from. Just so you can give it some kind of identification and access point. Even if you have multiple loose pages and say, well, these are all pages of kindred and we will leave it to the scholars to determine their significance and where they, where they fall in the drafting process. I didn't do as much research into um, black history at large because much of the process in the, of the archive really focuses on what you have in front of you. And so you don't want to be making decisions based on what you think you might find or how it might fit into the world. But you're trying to make decisions based on pure practical logistics. How many of these do I have? Of those notebooks, there's some 80 volumes of the notebooks, and I couldn't read through all of them. So you're making decisions like, how do I house these? How do I organize these? How do I identify them? In such a way that scholars will have an inkling of what's provided and what might be found in here. And I can direct them to those sources, simply so that we have access points to identify what might be there. And then it's the scholars who come in and use the materials and begin to do the interpretive work, um, really beyond what I'm able to do in the processing. The idea of the processing is to make it as accessible as possible and to you try and anticipate some of the ways that material would be used. And in a literary archive, of course, many people are purely looking at the text. And what they want to be able to see is every draft and all of the notes for a particular title. So you want to be able to keep those things together. You want to be able to see perhaps all of the letters to a particular editor about that one novel, as opposed to keeping all of her letters in a chronology so that you would have to sift through her letters from February, March, April, May, June, and July to be able to read all of the letters to the editor about a particular novel. In other collections, the answer might be different. It might be more important to know the chronology than it is who is writing to whom. So a lot of those decisions are really more based on the kinds of material in the archive rather than the larger history or even the larger literary world that surrounds it. Um, you try and keep it together in as whatever kind of cohesive pieces that you have, and then so that scholars can access those pieces and begin to do the interpretive work around it. That's great, thank you. Um, two questions kind of related. Uh, has anyone used the material to extend or write companion stories to her work? Or if not, do you have examples of how uh, they're using the information that scholars have gone into the Huntington to read and learn about? So I don't know of any anyone who's per se kind of taken maybe one of her worlds and written another story in it. The kinds of things that have happened with the archive, uh, a couple years ago we were able to partner with the local arts organization called Clock Shop. And Clock Shop brought in a dozen contemporary writers and contemporary artists to engage with the materials who then produced their own new works in different ways. So there was um, an exhibit at the Armory Center for the Arts, and one of the works was a photographer who was engaging with 
some of Butler's photography and some of her writing and ideas about landscape and space and physical geography to imagine geography and created these kind of multi-layered photographs out of her engagement with the archive, sometimes using images from the archive, composed with images from the Huntington and other places. Um, there was an author who reconstructed an interview that she never got to have with Octavia. She had, had met her and had talked with her and talked about doing an interview, but never was able to realize that interview. So she reconstructed what an interview might have happened out of looking at um, details and notes and Butler's own reflections and writings as responses to an interview of her talking that she drew out of the archive. Um, there was We hosted a, co a conference here, a symposium at the Huntington, um, and I believe you can listen to that on the, the Huntington's uh, podcast um, page. And one of the scholars was talking about Butler's interest in slime molds and researching slime molds, looking at the notes that Butler had taken and then doing her own research of what slime molds were and connecting those ideas of community to Butler's literary and fictional worlds. There was another scholar who was looking at um, Butler's use of disability and her interest in blindness and other kinds of able-bodiedness or disable-bodiedness and connecting them to various disability discourses that are occurring in literature and in scholarship at large. There's really quite a variety of, of approaches um, that people are, are taking to both, both artistic and academic. Um, I'm sure there are biographies that will be coming out of this archive, um, and, and not just one. I'm sure there'll be multiple takes. Um, and then, and certainly people who are still working on their dissertations from in, in both English or um, American studies or psychology, um, any number of different disciplines that are incorporating elements of Butler, either her literature, her self and her identity as a, a writing author and the struggles of an author, or the various themes and how she engages climate change or um, melanin in in skin or um, any number of other kinds of scientific or technological principles and how she weaves these realities into her fiction. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I had one question that I thought actually was kind of interesting. Uh, you spoke about the role that her um, mother played, but did Butler have any male presence during her childhood and youth? She did have a number of other family members that, that were close by. So she had aunts and uncles that she was very close with and cousins. Um, but it was definitely a very strong female presence in her life. Both her mother and also her grandmother was a huge port, uh, influence in her life, especially when she was very young. Um, she often spoke of really being raised by her mother and her grandmother. At one point, her mother had a, a chicken ranch out in Victorville. Um, and had been uh, a single mother uh, coming to California from, I believe it was Louisiana, with a number of children at a time when single mothers certainly didn't do that, especially not if they were black, but she survived and thrived, uh, even managing to have her own property and, and, and run this ranch. And those elements of watching her grandmother and her mother, um, Butler definitely talks about those as an influence, but she wasn't without any kind of male influences in her life because she did have strong family ties. Um, and I think uh, one more question. Sure. Um, do you think, so we're kind of in an age right now where um, we are starting to see more representation of people of color with the success of Black Panther and Crazy Rich Asians and everything like that. Um, do you think Butler would be as popular if she only had written about white characters or because she included black characters that represented her that that because of that that increased her popularity? That's an interesting question. I mean, I think I think she could have written about just white characters and the writing would have been as good because she would have worked hard. She was definitely a, a perspiration, not inspiration person, I say. She believed that you know, the good writing was 90% just hard work. Um, she didn't believe it was genius or anything, although 
as I mentioned, I, I tend to disagree. I think she was quite the genius. But I think she could have put in the work to write those stories and make good stories out of them. But I do think that one of the great strengths of her story is that personal identity that comes into them. And because she is a black woman, that she thinks about the world in a different way and she looks at the world a different way, which is why to me that voice of a person of color is what makes it so strong. Now, I think she could probably do that with white characters because that voice and that perspective and how she thinks about the world would still churn out different kinds of stories than what a white man would be writing. But it's certainly easier to see those differences when you have a cast of characters filled with people of color. And I think it's simply more realistic. And that's part of what brings out the popularity. Butler talked about putting people of different color in colors in her books. It's not just there's black people, there's Hispanic people, and there's Vietnamese people, and Asian people, and, and these character names. And she's looking at different languages to draw these names in. And she talks about actually growing up in Pasadena, where at her high school, there was a strong mix of Japanese and black and white. And she never felt like the world around her was just white. So why would she write a, write a world that was just white? Right. And, and so for her, it was very natural to assume that the future was going to be just as diverse, if, diverse, if not more so. And so I think that popularity um, definitely draws on that and, and really kind of takes it to the next level because it, seems, it would seem more and more strange as we begin to imagine the normality of diverseness, diversity. Um, to imagine a world that is so homogenous is becoming harder and harder to believe. And, and as I've talked about throughout the presentation, reality and authenticity was central to the underlying genesis of and, and, and creation of so many of the worlds that Butler is trying to create. Um, and that includes a world that is diverse. I, I I completely agree in her. I've only read Kindred, but I think her authenticity certainly comes through um, with that novel, as I'm sure it does throughout the course of her writing. I just wanted to thank you on behalf of the Caltech alumni and everybody here for the wonderful presentation. Um, I, re I think that um, it was truly amazing for you to show us some of the pieces of collection and how it was formalized and opened up to the public. I think that was really helpful to see the process as well as the actual papers too. Thank you. I hope I've given some insights both into Butler, a little bit to the Huntington and what we do in our special collections and how we can take Butler and, and other authors and people of interest from history to connect that to our modern world. That It's not just dusty old books on a shelf. It's really um, living collections that are about important conversations that we can have in the world today. And I think you did. You did a great job. And I, cer I certainly learned a lot from this presentation. So I just want to thank you on behalf of myself and everybody in the, in the group. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. And have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.